Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. A few weeks ago I began our analysis of the second solar spectrum by presenting these two videos. I highlighted that astronomers cannot make use of Einstein coefficients in order to calculate the densities of the chromosphere. This is because the use of Einstein coefficients requires that the atom or ion under investigation be completely free from all interactions with its environment. This is clearly not the case in the chromosphere as the presence of spicules imaged in calcium 2 or hydrogen alpha reveals. The reason one can image the spicules in calcium 2 is precisely because the ion is somehow being coordinated by spicular material. It is clearly not existing with a cloud-like distribution as would be expected if it was free from all coordination. The same holds true when the spicules are imaged in hydrogen alpha. As a result, one can infer that hydrogen experiences some degree of coordination in the chromosphere. Therefore, one cannot make use of Einstein coefficients measured in the laboratory and then apply them to the sun, the stars, or to nebular clouds. As mentioned in the second video, this invalidates thousands of papers in astrophysics. For those who are interested in the mathematics of spectroscopic line formation in astrophysics, you are free to consult several classic works on the subject. You will quickly notice how the Einstein coefficients enter into the problem, and when you combine this mathematical reality with the presence of spicules in the chromosphere, the consequences for astrophysics are tremendous. After the release of these two videos, I moved to the group 2A elements with this video on beryllium and demonstrated clear bias against assigning spectroscopic lines for this element and for beryllium hydride. If you have not seen these three videos, do have a look as they will facilitate your understanding of this presentation. The focus on group 2A arises because these elements are responsible for producing some of the strongest lines both in the Fraunhofer spectrum and in the second solar spectrum. Here, for instance, are the well-known Fraunhofer calcium H and K lines. Imaging the chromosphere using these lines, either at the core of the line or in the wings, serves to highlight that this region of the sun is filled with structure, as we just saw. The presence of structure directly refutes the accepted average density of the chromosphere in the standard model, which is only 10 to the minus 12 grams per centimeter cube, corresponding to 6.02 times 10 to the 11th particles per centimeter cubed. Once again, in this video I had emphasized that when we are imaging chromospheric spicules in the wings of the lines from calcium 2, we are relying on the fact that this ion is being coordinated by such structures. I noted that this renders all current estimates of chromospheric densities invalid because the Einstein coefficients determined in the laboratory are designed to be applied to the free ion. In order to use laboratory-derived Einstein coefficients, the ion cannot be interacting with anything. But clearly, the ions responsible for the calcium 2, H, and K lines on the Sun are being coordinated by chromospheric structures. Again, such coordination invalidates all density calculations by the solar physicist. This is true not only when using calcium 2 lines, but is also true for all lines from hydrogen. In fact, it is true for all the lines on the Sun because we can never exclude the possibility of undetected coordination for any ion. Now before we jump into the group 2A elements, we need to discuss how an ion responds to incoming radiation. In order to do that, let us use a simple illustration for the transitions between a lower energy state labeled 1 and a higher energy state labeled 2. Let us assume that a photon is absorbed while the ion is in the lower energy state 1. The absorbed photon can be characterized by a specific incoming direction, frequency and polarization. Typically only one photon is absorbed at a time, although two electron transitions are possible as we saw in these two videos. When a photon is absorbed, an electron will be promoted to the higher energy level 2. But eventually the ion will relax and return back to state 1. This is known as spontaneous emission. When this occurs, a new photon will be emitted. It is also possible that once an electron is excited, that the ion interacts with another photon and that two photons are released upon relaxation back to state 1. 
This is known as stimulated emission. As a result of all this, there are three Einstein coefficients used to describe these transitions, typically referred to as B12, B21, and A21. The B12 Einstein coefficient is related to the absorption of light and a transition from state 1 to state 2. The B21 Einstein coefficient is related to the stimulated emission, as a photon must first interact with the ion to stimulate the emission and relaxation from state 2. This results to the emission of two photons and return of the electron to state 1. Finally, the A21 Einstein coefficient relates to the spontaneous emission of a single photon as the electron moves back to state 1 from state 2. In the NIST table, this coefficient is labeled as AKI, but this is just a different way of expressing the Einstein A21 coefficient. One can use numbers or letters to label the two states. In the NIST tables, the upper state is labeled with the letter K and the lower state with the letter I. Now let us consider what happens to the ion after it initially absorbs a photon and moves to state 2. If the ion is free from all interaction with other ions, then during the short time between absorption and emission, it is able to rotate, translate, and collide with other species in its surroundings, including atoms, ions, or electrons. As a result of these collisions, the emitted photon will typically be distributed over a range of frequencies, polarizations, and directions. We say that complete redistribution has occurred. A photon which was initially absorbed is now re-emitted in a manner which is uncorrelated with the photon that had caused the absorption in the first place. That is why the process is referred to as complete redistribution. The ion had absorbed a photon, but on emission it was free to generate a photon with slight changes in frequency due to Doppler broadening arising from collisions and complete freedom as to the direction and polarization. Once again, this is called complete redistribution. Complete redistribution is what one expects in sparse plasmas because under such conditions, there is no possibility for the excited ion to interact or be coordinated with its neighbors. The densities are just too low. That is why if solar physicists are correct about their assumed density of the chromosphere, one should be able to analyze all spectroscopic lines with complete redistribution. No other process should occur in a sparse plasma without interionic interactions. Conversely, in very dense plasmas, something interesting happens. The ions are no longer able to emit with complete freedom, and one observes what is known as partial redistribution. In that case, the emitted photon is partially correlated to the incoming photon, whether in terms of frequency, direction, or polarization. The important aspect of partial redistribution in the laboratory is that it only occurs under one of two conditions, either in very dense plasmas or in plasmas at the edges of tokamak reactors. It never occurs in sparse gases or plasmas. Here, for instance, are three papers which present an analysis of partial redistribution as observed in a laboratory in very dense plasmas. The densities involved range from 10 to the 20th to 10 to the 25th particles per centimeter cubed. Such densities are tremendously elevated. Note that air at standard temperature and pressure has a particle density on the order of only about 2.7 times 10 to the 19th particles per centimeter cubed. As a result, the high density plasma studies are dealing with materials which are 10 to nearly 1 million times denser than air. In fact, in the laboratory, the study of partial redistribution usually involves very dense plasmas. But in very dense plasmas, we know that coordination of ions can take place and assemblies of ions can become so large that microfields form. It is clear that in the laboratory, partial redistribution is associated with coordination of the ion, as one can gather from this quotation. In a dense plasma, the photon frequency redistribution in the rest frame of the emitter results from fast shaking of the atomic states by electrons and slow shifts of the states by ions. The action of electrons can be taken into account quite simply, whereas lengthy numerical calculations are required to take into account the effect of ions. This is because a large number of ions participate simultaneously in the interaction. And this makes the dynamics of the ionic microfield FFT complicated. 
Now, partial redistribution is also observed at plasma edges in tokamak reactors as discussed in this paper. In that case, the plasma densities are on the order of 10 to the 15th particles per centimeter cubed. The standard solar model invokes average densities of only 6 times 10 to the 11th particles per centimeter cubed for the chromosphere. As a result, the densities observed at the plasma edges in tokamak reactors are still at least 10,000 times denser than the average densities invoked by the standard solar model in the chromosphere. However, in the tokamak, the wall of the reactor is interacting with the plasma and producing the observed need for partial redistribution at the plasma edge. Condensed matter is clearly present, which is governing the behavior of the plasma in this case. You can learn more about attempts to understand the physics of plasma edges in tokamak reactors in these papers. Most notably, it is well established that the plasma edge and the wall of the reactor are tightly coupled, as highlighted in this quote. The edge plasma and the wall are a strongly coupled system whose interactions range over an extraordinary width of scale from electron volt scale atomic interactions to 100 megajoule disruptions. This 27 order of magnitude range in energy rivals the ratio between the size of a grain of dust and the 3 times 10 to the 21st meter scale of the known universe. Unfortunately, given these realities and despite concentrated efforts, it is clear that our mathematical methods are falling short of fully describing what is happening between the edge of the plasma and the wall of the reactor. In any event, studies which do not involve examination of plasma edges in tokamak reactors often rely on very heavy ions. These studies are focused on extreme ionization states and have recourse to species such as aluminum-12, argon-18, and krypton-36, as one can see here. In such cases, all but one or two electrons have been stripped from the atom. In the laboratory, the ion dynamics therefore become important in governing partial redistribution. The densities are so elevated and the ionization is so high that interatomic interactions cannot be ignored and that leads to partial redistribution. Here is a relevant quote. The presence of the ion plasma microfield is essential for the calculation of the redistribution function of the multi-charged ion radiation in dense plasmas. However, these conditions can never be met in a chromosphere associated with the standard solar model for two reasons. First, the ions present in the chromosphere are either neutral or in the second ionization state at best. They have not been stripped of their electrons. Nothing like Krypton-36 exists in the chromosphere. Secondly, the standard solar model invokes average densities of only 6 times 10 to the 11th particles per centimeter cubed. These densities are between 1 billion and 1 trillion fold lower than what scientists are using in the laboratory when they have recourse to partial redistribution in plasmas beyond the plasma edges of tokamak reactors. Despite all of this, the astronomers still believe that they can directly translate the results obtained in the laboratory to their standard model of the chromosphere. They therefore apply partial redistribution methods to account for solar line shapes for all the strongest chromospheric lines, as we shall soon discover. They do so while recognizing that the strongest chromospheric lines are optically thick. For instance, if one images the sun exactly at the frequency of the strongest chromospheric lines for calcium-2, magnesium-2, and hydrogen alpha, one does not see the photosphere at all, but rather the upper level of the chromosphere, as can be seen in these three images. That is why these chromospheric lines are considered optically thick. Yet the upper chromosphere is thought to have a particle density of only 9.64 times 10 to the 9th particles per centimeter cubed. That is about 100,000 times lower than what was monitored in the tokamak plasma edges. Yet, unlike the claims of the standard model, the materials involved in producing the observed images is in fact so dense at these elevations that very little light from the underlying photosphere directly reaches the telescope. Yet, despite this sure sign of elevated density, the astronomers continue to argue that the chromosphere has a density of a powerful vacuum. In a complete disconnect from laboratory reality, since the lines are optically thick, astronomers then believe that they can safely apply partial redistribution methods to chromospheric lines without any reconsideration of what this means relative to densities. Such arguments are without merit. 
Again, in the laboratory, partial redistribution arises under one of two conditions. In the first case, ions within the plasma are interacting at the inner ionic level. Such interactions requires tremendously elevated densities on the order of 10 to the 20th or 10 to the 25th particles per centimeter cubed. In the second laboratory case, partial redistribution occurs at tokamak plasma edges where plasma densities remain about 100,000 times denser than in the upper chromosphere of the standard solar model. But in the tokamak, powerful interactions are known to exist between the plasma edge and the wall of the reactor. The interactions cannot be created simply by invoking that thousands of kilometers of material are being sampled and that the sample is now optically thick. Either the densities must be high enough to permit interionic interactions or condensed matter must be present. Neither of these conditions exist in the chromosphere of the standard solar model of the Sun. It is for this reason that the use of partial redistribution methods by the astronomers along with the presence of chromospheric spicules provides solid evidence that elevated densities and condensed matter exist in the solar chromosphere in direct contradiction to what is being proposed by the standard model. As a result, when one sees that partial redistribution needs to be invoked to explain chromospheric lines, it is a sure sign that the densities present in the chromosphere are many-fold greater than currently hypothesized in the standard model. Moreover, the best way to produce the needed microfields involves coordination with condensed matter. This is a lesson which can be gathered by studying partial redistribution at tokamak plasma edges where densities of 10 to the 15th particles per centimeter cubed are involved. This is yet another warning that condensed matter is found in the chromosphere as I have long highlighted. To claim that the chromosphere is the site of a powerful vacuum relative to the Earth's atmosphere at sea level and yet at the same time require partial redistribution while ignoring the presence of clear chromospheric structures such as spicules amounts to scientific recklessness in the standard model. This can only be resolved by abandoning the currently accepted chromospheric densities. With this groundwork, it is time to turn our attention finally to the group 2A elements, namely beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium. Let us begin by noting the electron configuration, first ionization potential, and relative photospheric abundances for each of these elements. Of course, beryllium has the highest first ionization potential at 9.3 electron volts. But note that the first ionization potential for magnesium at 7.65 electron volts is well above that typically observed for other chromospheric lines. At the same time, notice that magnesium has the highest accepted relative abundance of the group 2A elements, being more than 17 times more common than calcium. I have also decided to present the abundances for these elements in the chondrites as taken from Fodor's Table 3, and also present the abundances in the Earth's crust as taken from the CRC handbook. These values were first converted from mass in parts per million to numbers of atoms. This was then normalized by making the magnesium value in the chondrites and in the Earth's crust exactly match the relative abundance hypothesized to exist in the photosphere. When this is done, it is readily apparent that photospheric relative abundances directly parallel what has been observed in the chondrites. Of course, that is because scientists want these values to agree. However, the solar values are very different from the values found in the Earth's crust. There is approximately 500 times more beryllium in the Earth's crust than reported on the solar photosphere. Similarly, the Earth's crust contains about 20 times more calcium, 200 times more strontium, and 1500 times more barium than reported in the solar photosphere. This exercise serves to highlight that we have to be careful in extrapolating anything from the chondrites. They have no more real merit relative to determining solar abundances than does the Earth's crust. That is because we can never be certain of the formation mechanisms involved either in the chondrites or in the Earth. We have only guesses. Now in order to present the group 2 elements, I have decided to focus on four sets of transitions which represent well-known lines. For each set of lines and for each group 2A elements, I provide the wavelengths, transitions, and associated term symbols. These four sets of transitions correspond first to the famous doublet or HK line analogs for the ionized atoms, second to the atomic triplet to triplet transitions, third to the atomic singlet to singlet transitions, and finally to the forbidden atomic singlet to triplet transitions for the neutral atom. Today I will only deal with the doublet transitions. I will address the last three in the next video. 
we begin by examining the group 2A doublets produced after the loss of a single electron, of which the calcium 2, H, and K lines are the most prominent members in the optical range. The strength of this doublet is absolutely fascinating. In fact, the calcium 2, H, and K transitions constitute the two most powerful lines in the optical Fraunhofer spectrum by far. To help take the point home, have a look at the next most powerful lines in the Fraunhofer as indicated in this classic figure. The strongest lines in this figure correspond to the calcium 2 HK lines, the hydrogen alpha and beta lines, the sodium D1 and D2 lines, and finally the iron 1 line at 5270. The spectrum for each of these is now plotted over the same range of wavelengths. It is clear from this exercise that the calcium 2 H and K lines are by far the strongest in the optical Fraunhofer. Next, we can examine the extent of polarization of the calcium 2 H and K lines. Amazingly, strong polarization is seen both for the calcium K line and for the H line. I say amazingly because the calcium H line should be intrinsically unpolarizable. Why is that? If we examine the term symbols for the doublets, it will be noted that the H line analogs all involve a J equal one half to J equal one half transition. Because these lines result from transitions between two J equal one half levels, they are intrinsically unpolarizable since such levels cannot have atomic alignment as one can learn in this paper. In fact, this is exactly the kind of transition which occurs for the sodium D1 line as I had mentioned in the first video on the second solar spectrum. For the sodium D1 line, we are again experiencing a J equal one half to J equal one half transition as noted here. Soon, we will return to the fact that all these lines should be intrinsically unpolarizable because in reality, they can all be polarized and it is interesting to learn how astrophysics has dealt with the problem. For now, let us simply note the strength of the calcium 2 H and K lines and the fact that the calcium 2 H line was indeed polarizable. But there is one other important point. In order to account for the line shape of the calcium 2 line, solar physicists must have recourse to partial redistribution, as one can learn in these papers. Here is a relevant quotation. Contrary to many photospheric lines, which can be modeled assuming photon scattering with complete redistribution, CRD, the resonance doublet and the infrared triplet of calcium-2 are formed in the chromosphere and require a more accurate treatment of resonance photon scattering with partial redistribution. In PRD, the frequency and direction of the ingoing and outgoing photon in a scattering event can be correlated. To the contrary, they are independent in CRD. The authors further emphasize the point. We found that PRD is essential for the H and K lines. This is a sure sign that the chromospheric densities advanced by the standard solar model are simply incorrect. Once again, either the chromospheric densities are in the range of 10 to the 20th to 10 to the 25th particles per centimeter cubed, or there is condensed matter in the chromosphere which acts to coordinate these ions and results in the need to invoke partial redistribution. Obviously, since the spicules can be imaged in calcium-2, it is evident that the use of partial redistribution in this case is a direct indication that the ion is interacting with condensed matter in the chromosphere. That was the lesson learned by noting the need for partial redistribution when analyzing plasma lines at the edges of tokamak reactors. Recall that at the edge of the tokamak reactor, the plasma was strongly interacting with the wall, and that is why partial redistribution had to be used in that case. Now let us consider the magnesium H and K lines at 2795.53 and 2802.71 angstroms. Here is the spectrum of these lines as taken by the IRIS satellite. The transitions occur in the ultraviolet and are powerful in the Fraunhofer. The magnesium H and K lines have strong emission at their cores and these features dominate the figure. Both the magnesium H and K lines are polarized at the limb as one can learn in these papers. Unfortunately, this wavelength range is not covered in the Gandorfer database utilized in previous presentations. The first thing to note about any line produced by magnesium 2 is that these lines are indeed chromospheric lines despite the fact that the first ionization potential for magnesium is 7.65 electron volts. This poses a problem for the astronomers, and hence they claim that the lines are formed only in the upper chromosphere. 
despite the fact that the lines are so optically thick that they can never sample the lower chromosphere at these frequencies. In any event, it is clear that the magnesium H line can once again be polarized as can be gathered in these papers, and we will return to this later. For now, our interest rests in the fact that in order to explain the magnesium H and K lines, one must again have recourse to partial redistribution as highlighted by the Del Pino Almond paper from 2016. Our results confirm the importance of partial redistribution effects in the formation of magnesium 2 H and K lines as pointed out by previous work in the non-magnetic case. Later in the paper, they go on. Another increasingly important aspect of the modeling of chromospheric spectral lines in realistic solar scenarios is the ability to account for the higher temporal coherence between the process of absorption and re-emission of the solar radiation, which is fostered by the particular physical state of the tenuous chromospheric plasma. This condition of partially coherent scattering gives rise to a plethora of phenomena commonly dubbed partial frequency redistribution, PRD, which must be taken into account for a proper diagnosis of the plasma and magnetic properties of the chromosphere. Of course, in having recourse to partial redistribution, these scientists are invoking that the particular physical state of the chromosphere is in fact not tenuous at all, contrary to their claims, as we saw when examining the calcium-2 lines. The magnesium-2 ion is being coordinated by structure, as clearly illustrated in this image. That is why partial redistribution must be invoked. In order to see the importance that the use of partial redistribution has in accounting for the shape of a spectral line, just have a look at this figure as reproduced from astronomy and astrophysics. Note that when complete redistribution is utilized to model the magnesium-2 K line, as indicated by the yellow curve, the spectrum is not at all reproduced. The line is most closely reproduced either with a 1D or 3D partial redistribution in red and white respectively. Here is what the authors claim about their work. In summary, we have shown for the magnesium 2K line that its profile as well as the profile features are influenced by both PRD and 3D effects. The 1D PRD approximation reproduces the wavelength position of the features and can be used to accurately compute intensities in the inner wings. The intensity and wavelength position of K3 can be computed using 3D CRD at disk center, but not towards the limb. Accurate quantitative modeling of the whole line profile and its center to limb variation requires 3D PRD. The point is made. Partial redistribution is absolutely critical to modeling the magnesium-2 lines, and that implies the presence of coordination with condensed matter in the chromosphere of the Sun, just as we saw in the case of the calcium-2 lines. Now that we have completed our view of the magnesium-2 and calcium-2 doublets, we can have a quick look at the beryllium-2, strontium-2, and barium-2 cases. The beryllium-2 doublet is weak in the sun and occurs at 3130.4 and 3131.1 angstroms as was presented in the last video. This figure is extracted from data provided by the Paris Observatory. The region has not been sampled in the data for the second solar spectrum provided by Gandorfer. Here are the strontium doublet lines which appear at 4077.714 and 4214.524 angstroms in the NIST tables. Both lines are strongly polarized in the Gandoffer spectrum once again, despite the fact that the strontium H line should be unpolarizable. The strontium 2K line at 4077.7 angstroms is extremely important in solar physics, as one can learn in these papers. This line has been used to measure the strength of weak magnetic fields on the Sun using the Hanley effect. It has been assumed that for the linear scattering polarization of the strontium 2K line, the critical magnetic field where the Hanley effect is maximal occurs at 10.75 Gauss. This arises from equation 1 in this paper as shown here. Notice that within this equation, the Einstein coefficient for spontaneous emission is present. But remember that this coefficient assumes that the strontium-2 ion is free from all interactions with other ions or atoms. Here is a quote which can help in this area. Given a known magnetic field geometry, the Hanley effect has been used by atomic physicists to measure the lifetimes of atomic levels. However, in astronomical applications, the transition lifetimes are taken as known, and the Hanley effect may be used to derive information about the magnetic field properties in the line formation region. 
For a system with only two energy states, the transition lifetimes neglecting collisions is simply the inverse of the Einstein A21 coefficient. Therefore, it is evident that if conditions in the sun or in a star differ from those in the laboratory, this will greatly affect any attempt to measure magnetic fields with the Hanley effect. That an ion is not undergoing any coordination can never be assured in the sun, and therefore all calculations of magnetic fields using the Hanley effect in the chromosphere are invalid, not just for this ion, but for all others. This is just another example of the risk of applying such coefficients to the sun. One can never be certain that the transition lifetimes measured in the laboratory are directly applicable to any celestial object, precisely because we have no means to evaluate the effect of ionic coordination in such objects. I will return to the Hanley effect in the next video, but in this regard there is a great difference between measuring magnetic fields with the Hanley effect, which depends on an Einstein coefficient, and the Zeeman effect, which does not. I had covered both effects briefly in this video, but at the time I had not brought the Hanley effect into question. Now I am discounting all measurements of solar magnetic fields with the Hanley effect. While there is no reason to question the strength of magnetic fields determined using the Zeeman effect, there is every reason to reject the strength of any solar magnetic field measured by the Hanley effect. Again, the Hanley effect depends on proper knowledge of the Einstein A21 coefficient on the Sun and such knowledge will always escape humanity. Coordination of ions occurs in the chromosphere and therefore we do not know the proper value of the needed Einstein coefficients. Finally, we come to the barium-2 doublets at 4554 and 4934 angstroms. Both lines are strongly polarized and once again the proper analysis of the barium-2 line at 4554 angstroms depends on the use of partial redistribution as one can learn in this paper. Here is the relevant quotation. In this paper we present radiative transfer modeling with partial frequency redistribution PRD which is shown to be essential in the modeling of this line. Once again, we see that the use of partial redistribution becomes critical in modeling a spectroscopic line on the Sun. This is a sure sign that all chromospheric densities presented within the standard solar model are incorrect. Chromospheric densities are much more elevated than currently believed. This is an excellent example of how we have been misled by our theoretical models for the gaseous Sun which requires extremely low chromospheric densities. Well, that is all for now. Again, what we understand as accepted in astrophysics has slowly been incorporated into this area of science through our biases enforced by our models and theories. The case against the standard solar model of the chromosphere will continue to build as we explore more spectroscopic lines in this region of the Sun. So if you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club, support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below and I'll see you soon on the next video.